have one that's given a song and one that's given a word, one that's given a testimony kind of thing. And so it is really totally appropriate if you have something that you feel like God is really laying on your heart, come talk to me and, you know, about, you know, sharing it with the body and stuff at the service. So it's, it's important to remember where we are with God. And that is in a place of love. But I mean, I, that's, that's the real thing I want to emphasize is that God loves us so much, right? And he's not out there looking to whack us, you know, when we mess up. You know, when we mess up, God loves us into a position of, hey, let's straighten that out. Let's restore the relationship. And we have that issue about restoring relationships as a ministry that God has given us. God has passed on that ministry of reconciliation to us as believers. Reconciliation between individuals, between families, between people and God. It isn't just about salvation. It's about when we say reconciliation. That's an important thing. But once we have that level of reconciliation, we're called to be reconciled to each other. And it's wonderful when brothers and sisters can dwell together in unity because that fragrance of love and that relationship lifts up and draws other people into that relationship. You know, I think, you know, if you've been out in the world enough, you can, you can, and you go into certain environments, you can feel and sense and smell evil. Just like you can feel and sense and smell righteousness and holiness and when we walk in a path into the world we bring holiness and righteousness and love of God with us and it overwhelms evil right light displaces darkness darkness does not overwhelm light darkness is nothing right light is what god created and we are the light of the world through jesus christ and we bring that into the world and that does tie into what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about this thing about the beams in our eyes right and so we're going to we're going to be in matthew uh the sermon on the mount this is chapter seven but we're going to continue talking about what Jesus commanded. In the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples to make disciples and teach them everything I have commanded you. And so we are going through the thing about picking out the commands of Jesus. And so since the beginning of the year, we've been talking about the different commands that Jesus has made. The imperative statements, let's say. It's easy to pick out when you look at the biblical Greek. It's a little harder in English. But we're going to talk about you know, what Jesus told his followers to do, how to live and how to act and how to be. And that's what we're going to talk about that a little bit again today from the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. But there's something I want to uh, point out a little bit before we get into the message is that, you know, when we're singing and we have worship time, it's something that we have to enter into ourselves to, and to talk to God and sing and worship to God. God loves us, and it doesn't matter whether we can sing. Everybody knows that I am incompetent with singing, just like I'm incompetent with dancing, right? I mean, it is just, it, it's just, it just don't work. <laughs> Tawny gave up on me a long, long, long time ago about singing and dancing. It, it, it just, you know, there are certain things I can do and certain things that I cannot. And some of y'all have heard me say this before, but, uh, you know, I could land a 65,000 pound aircraft on a ship at sea at night, but I can't sing and I can't dance. It's just limitations, right? But God doesn't care whether you can sing or not because he loves you so much that he doesn't judge. He doesn't criticize us for trying to sing and trying to dance in his presence because God is a good parent and loves us beyond measure. So when we're worshiping, feel free to enter in. Whether you think you can sing or not, God likes it, all right? And, you know, we're, we're entering in with the angels in heaven worshiping God. Glory, glory, glory is the Lord God of hosts. And so that, like, when Josh, you know, goes off and he's, he's saying words and singing, and it's not words on the screen, that's what's called a selah, 
Okay, you can if you, you know if you have a study Bible and you open it to Psalms, you'll see it in the Psalms off to the side in the margin, and it'll say Selah. Okay, Selah comes from a Hebrew ro root word meaning to lift up. That's where you pause in the psalm, and they would pause the singing of the psalm, and they would lift up praises to God, extemporaneous type praises to God. It's a Selah time. Sometimes it would be like meditation type time. You don't have to sing like an enthusiastic, happy Selah. It could be a Selah that's like, God, I've had a tough time, but I lift it up to you, and I worship you, and I put it in your hands. That's a Selah moment, you know, and that's what Selah is, okay? Some of y'all know that Peyton named her cat Selah, okay? Now this, this is a high energy cat. It's not a low energy cat, okay? This is the kind of cat when they were, Nathan and, and Peyton were on their honeymoon this past week, you know, after getting married the week before, you know, I was charged with going off and visiting and taking care of Selah, right? You know, so when I went to visit Selah, not only was I, you know, changing the water and, you know, putting cat food out and, you know, cleaning out the litter box and you know, all those things you deal with when you got a cat, you got to spend time with the cat because the cat's lonely, right? So the cat wants fellowship and relationship, but it's a high energy cat, even though she's getting a little bit fat and a little bit old, you know, she's still a high energy cat. And so I took my pruning gloves along. They have things that go up to here, okay? You know, and I know I need to get some for Nathan because Nathan's going to have an adjustment. Everybody has adjustments when you get married, right? Okay, the cat is a big adjustment for him, right? Nathan's kind of a neat freak. Peyton, not so much. You know, and the cat doesn't help. And so the deal is, is there's going to be some adjustment that goes there, and Nathan's mother's kind of concerned about <laughs> the adjustment with the cat. But it'll all work out. I need to get him some long gloves because Selah will sometimes eat your shoelaces and, you know, attack your shoes. And, but, you know, if you pet the cat just right, she just loves it and she just lays there, everything's okay. You touch the belly, all of a sudden, hey, it's cat wrestling time. You know, world wrestling fellowship thing or whatever it is, what they call it, wrestling. The cat decides that it's time to attack. And so, you know, that's why you gotta have these long gloves. You know, she's got sharp teeth. Anyway, the, Let's see, I got through at one point on the thing. Anyway, the idea is you spend time with the cat. Now, why am I saying this about the cat? Because Selah is her name. I want you to remember Selah. Okay, Selah is something where we lift up to God, right? You take a break, you know, during praise and worship and stuff, you lift that up to God. That's what it's talking about in the Psalms when you see that word Selah in the Psalms, okay? And so that's totally good and appropriate to break off from whatever the psalm or the song is and spend some time communicating with God in your own words extemporaneously. And so we're going to talk about beams in our eyes. Okay, I got a piece of wood here. And, you know, when you go into Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 1, is where we're going to talk about this, but this is called the beams in our eyes. And the idea here is that Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount talking to people about how we should live, right? And the first thing is, is in, in this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, which has been going on in Ma the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, since chapter 5 through verse chapter 6. Now we're going into chapter 7, and he's talking about this thing this, uh, we call the Sermon on the Mount. This is a, a passage in Scripture that is talked about even by secular people as an example of one of the best pieces of speech ever written. One of the best passages of literature ever written. And so even secular people recognize the importance of the Sermon on the Mount as a life changing event. But a lot of people throughout history said, oh, I can't live up to that, so I'm not even going to try. Or some people have taught that it's like, that's only for special people. That's only for the really spiritual. The rest of us live at a lower level. And those are not true opinions. Those are cop-outs. The reality is Jesus called all of his followers to live this way. 
okay, in the Sermon on the Mount, even if it's not always easy. But that's why we're going through all of these things to understand what is it that is really being said here and what does this mean and how do we do it in our modern lives today? How does this really happen today? And so it starts off with judge not that you not be judged. You ever notice that before? You know, this thing about you point your finger at somebody and you got three fingers pointing back at you. You know, that's why I like to do it this way. So all my fingers are pointing at somebody. But the idea is, is that we are always trying to get down on somebody else, right? And this is where he's talking about judge that you not be judged. You know, it's, there's a law, there's a spiritual principle called reciprocity, right? Give that you may receive, press down, shaken together, and people will pour back into your bosom. You know, there's the thing about judge and you will be judged. You know, the measure that you use is the measure that you're going to receive. And that's the way life really is. It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual principle. It isn't just about following what the Scripture says because God created this world and He set this world up with certain ways that it operates. And this is, the, this is just simply truth that Jesus is saying. If you judge, you're going to be judged. So judge not that you not be judged. For the judgment you pronounce is the same thing you're going to be judged with. And the measure you use is the way you're going to receive. You know, in English, it's really kind of hard to take the biblical Greek right here and put it into English that's so easy to read. Because that thing where it says pronounce, you know, there's three words in a row that are basically different forms of judgment. Du, 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 du. You know, it, it basically, don't judge, you will be judged. And this thing about pronouncing judgment. So that where it says pronounce, that's a judicial term of this is the result of the court decision from the judge. So if you give a d decision about how somebody else is doing something or what they're doing or how they're doing it or how they're dressed or how they're acting or how they're singing or their lack of dancing ability, you know, be careful because you're going to receive something back in some way, you know, and it's going to be a similar type thing, right? You know, and it's, that's just the way the system works that God has established. But Jesus is telling us to be careful with that. And he asked this question, why do you see that little speck in your brother's eye? But you don't notice the log that's in your own eye. The word is in the English Standard Version, they use the word log um, for a historical reason. Uh, the, the word that's there, the Greek word, is a beam, like a structural beam for your ceiling. Like, you know, I mean, like there's a structural beam that runs along here and runs along there, right, Dave? You all designed this building. But the issue is, is there's structural members up there that, you know, where all the pieces of the roof line and the, and the structural system come together. When they use that word that's translated as log here, it means a beam, a big, giant thing of pieces of wood laminated together. Or in the days of Jesus, likely in a lot of homes, it would be a log, they take a log from down by the Jordan River and they come back and it would be structurally to help hold up the ceiling and the roof, right? And so it might be just a log. It might be rough hewn or in more modern terms, it might be a giant piece of plank that's bound together so that you get the structural integrity. But what Jesus is saying with this hyperbole statement about you got this log in your own eye so how can you say to somebody else, let me take that little problem that you got when you ignore this real problem that I have, right? I'm living in sin. I got this issue. I have this thing, but I want to correct you. It makes me feel better to put you down, judge you, critique you, um, and that way I can ignore my problem, right? You ever notice that, that people like to tear somebody else down because it makes them feel more powerful or they're trying to push you down so they feel elevated? Well, maybe we have all done that, right? You know, there's times when we've all failed in this way where we, you know, rip onto somebody and we, you know, make ourselves feel better. But it doesn't last. You know, that, that kind of feeling of putting somebody else down it may be a temporary high, but it's not a long-term high. It makes us, it, it, it hurts in the long run because you damage the relationship because sooner or later you find out that nobody wants to be around you anymore. 
because you're always judging them, right? And that's what Jesus said. Avoid that because it's going to come back at you. And so we're going to talk today about how do we avoid some of that problem? How do we change our lives in our modern world, our modern way of following Jesus, that we <clears throat> avoid doing this, right? And Jesus said, take that, you know, the, 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 you got that log in the eye, but he, said, he tells people, his followers, and he calls them hypocrites when they, we do this, to take the log out of our own eye, the big thing, out of the way, so that we can see clearly to help somebody else. He's not telling us, don't try and help somebody else through their sin or their difficulty or their problems. We, we're called to do that. But we got to get our own act together instead of being a hypocrite of saying, hey, you got this problem, let me straighten you out. No, I straighten me out, and then I can see clearly to help somebody else, right? Now I'm going to put this, you know, add a couple things in here as we go about how do we avoid this thing. You know, when, when I was uh, first at the academy that first year, we had to learn a lot of different stuff, things. We had to memorize different stuff. You know, how many panes of glass are in the skylight in Memorial Hall? 400 and... Dana, do you remember? 400 and, I don't know. It was 400 and something. Anyway, you had to learn a whole lot of different things, you know, and they had to quiz you on all this stuff. And one of them was something, it was a big, long, giant poem called The Laws of the Navy. Now, these are the laws of the Navy, and many then varied they be, but he who is wise will observe them going down in his ship to the sea. Take heed what you say of your seniors. Let your words be spoken softly or plain, lest a bird of the air tell the matter, and so shall ye hear it again. You know, the deal is, you better be careful what you say. Let your words be sweet and tender because you may have to eat them, right? You know, the words is going to come back. You talk about people and you issue judgment about so-and-so, and you're thinking you're talking to somebody who's going to keep it quiet. Oh, no, they're not. You know, they're, they're going to talk it and eventually it's going to come back to you. That's what we mean about this thing about judgment and about this reciprocity thing, about it comes back to the ding is, you know, we have this problem that's going to come back. Okay, and so Jesus told a parable to help explain this kind of thing, right? And so he had this parable. So this is in the Gospel of Luke, oh, which of course is my favorite gospel. And <laughs> favorite book of the Bible. Well, actually, my favorite book is James. But the, he, you know, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, which could be anybody, but it's probably directed toward the Pharisees, right? But it thought they were righteous. They treated others with contempt. So two people went up to the temple to pray. And of course, in Jerusalem, you're always going uphill. And the temple is up higher even when you're in Jerusalem, and so you're always going up to the, to the temple. And so when you leave the temple, you're going down from the temple. And so two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, right? And so in today's world, who would we prefer to be with, the Pharisee or the tax collector? Neither? Okay. <laughs> and so the deal is, is that, you know, in the days of Jesus, the Pharisees were respected and looked up to. They were the popular. Most people said, I can't live to that level. But you had different groups within Judaism in the day. The Pharisees were one group. We would call them a denomination today. The Sadducees were another. The Essenes were another. And there were, you know, there was maybe four or five little bitty splinter small groups and stuff out there, you know, zealots and others. But the issue is, is that the Pharisees were kind of actually popular with the population. They didn't, not everybody thought they could live up to that. But they were respected because they're following the law. They're teachers of the law. They know the law. And so, okay, we'll do what they say kind of thing. But they also recognized that there was some hypocrisy in there. They weren't always living up to what they said to do. That was the big problem Jesus had with the Pharisees is because they, they would say one thing and not necessarily do it. They were hypocrites, right? And so you had this Pharisee and the tax collector going up to the temple. 
And the Pharisee, standing by himself, because Pharisee basically comes from a root word that means to separate, you know, separate yourself from the, the unclean, you know, people who can't live up to our standard. And so the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. <laughs> it's like, you know, have any of us ever thought that? I'm sure glad that I'm not like them. You know, look down on other people. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this scummy tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes and all I get. But the tax collector standing far off that is far off from the altar, you know, in the court at the temple, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, would beat his breast and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've fallen short. I'm not perfect. And you know what? None of us are. But God in his infinite love through Jesus Christ, made a way for us to have the right relationship with God, to redeem that sin, to take us out of that. And if Jesus is teaching this parable, I'm going to say, there's nothing in the Bible that says this, but this is my opinion, that this kind of thing really happened. He's talking from his own experience of being in the temple and observing this, is my opinion. Jesus is saying, hey, dudes, I've seen you guys. I've seen you go in, and when you worship the Father, you're bragging about yourself. Whereas that tax collector over there recognizes that he's a sinner, and he's fallen short. I'm surprised that they even let the tax collector into the temple, to be honest in that day. But the idea, and maybe he didn't actually get into the temple. Maybe he's out in the court of the Gentiles because it says he's standing far off. Right? Do you remember that in the temple of the day there were different, <clears throat> there were different levels. There was the court of the Gentiles so the non-Jewish people could only go past, could not go past this fence. It was probably stood about this tall, they think. And it had signs on it warning them under penalty of death not to pass that point. And there would be people there watching. So if you remember in the book of Acts, where it says that they, had, <clears throat> they thought Paul had brought a Greek into the temple, that meant that he had passed that, that point. It, it's not what happened, but some people thought he had brought him in there because they had seen him in the city together earlier. You know, that would be going past that wall. And so you had the court of the Gentiles out here, and you had the court of the women, and then you had the, inner, the next court were the men. And then you had the temple proper itself, which only the priests you know, could go into. And then you had the Holy of Holies that only the high priest once a year could go into. You know, there's this separation. They're trying to separate and push the holiness of God. But Jesus Christ broke down those barriers. Remember it says in the scripture that the, the, that curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies was torn asunder to make a way for all of us to come to God and have relationship with God. But the point of this thing is, is that Jesus is saying, God has mercy on those who come to him. Whereas the person who comes and is condemning somebody else isn't receiving that kind of mercy. You can still be saved. You could go to heaven, but you're not receiving the kind of grace that you could receive in the world and live in the world and have relationships with other people because you're condemning others and it's blocking you from living the way you need to live and could live a victorious life because we're tearing other people down and other people don't want to be around that. So Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. That is a tax collector. Remember what I said, everybody goes up to the temple and when you leave the temple, you're going down from the temple. So he went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
justified rather than the Pharisee who was not justified, was not accepted. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbled himself will be exalted. This is just another example of the thing about God turns the world up system upside down. To follow Jesus is to not follow the world system. What does the world system say? Make myself look good. Build myself up. I'm perfect. And what do you see politicians do? They tell us about how wonderful they are and how rotten and scummy everybody else is. It's a bunch of Pharisees talking about tax collectors, right? It's the same thing today, just in a different, more modern pattern. But it's the exact same mentality. And what does Jesus call us to do? Jesus calls us to live in a way that's extremely different from the world around us. He's telling us to take the blinder or the beam in our eye out and get ourselves right with God so that we can help other people through life. Right? It's not about us, it's about others. And when you talk about love in the scriptural context, it's about helping other people and living for other people and living for God and walking with God and not about ourselves. And so, Scripture says then in Romans, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. I want to talk about a little bit about what it says in the book of Romans then. Because right before this in Scripture, in, in the book of Romans, Paul's going through how people in the world are living with a debased mind. Right? And he's talking about how they live. They're full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness and gossips and slanderers. They're haughty and they're boastful disobedient to parents. They're foolish and faithless. Right? And man, he's getting down on all the things that we actually still do. You know, and it talks about being murderers and, you know, sinful lives and, you know, adulterers and other things that we may or may not do, but there's a lot of stuff that we do or have done. A lot of us have done a lot of these things. And he says, <clears throat> he's going on to talk about that, that we judge others. And we've done a whole bunch of all that same stuff. The issue is, is that we don't want to condemn others. We want to live the right way because Jesus Christ has made a way for us to escape that condemned sinful life of our past and walk in righteousness before God through faith in Jesus Christ. When we give our life to Jesus, surrender our life, not just say the words, but surrender myself to follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, my world changes. It doesn't mean that it's always easy, but my world changed when I decided to do that. And I had grown up in church. I knew all the rules. I knew that this and that. But it works the other way around, too. You know, when you nag on your wife to say, hey, you need to do this different, you know, it doesn't work very well. You need to lift them up to God. Yeah. You got a problem with with your spouse, hey, God, I got a problem with this spouse you gave me. And God's going to turn around and say, well, take the log out of your eye first. <laughs> right? We got to get to the point where we need to look at ourselves, right, and straighten out what we are and who we are because in passing judgment, we condemn ourselves. Right? And so that's what Scripture is talking about here, Right? You know, because none of us are perfect. Even though, I mean, I mean, you can be saved. God's justified the sin. He's redeemed us. He's set us free from hell, death, and the grave, right? But that doesn't mean we become perfect instantly. It takes a while sometimes, you know, always, to improve and become more and more and more like Jesus Christ, right? But we have to be willing to do that. It, God's not going to smack us with a stick and say, okay, now you're perfect. You know, we have to work through that. And God doesn't force us to become like Jesus. We have to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us and in us 
and change us, renew our minds, that our behavior can change, right? We don't want to model ourselves on the behavior of the world around us, but we want to let our behavior change, modeled on our new mind, it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, so that we can understand the will of God and what it is that God wants. And we go follow it. And so how then do we stop doing this judging thing, right, and become more like what Jesus calls us to do and be? Well, there's, there's a series of things in Scripture, and we don't have time to go through them all, but we're going to look at a couple of them. One of them is in Colossians um, chapter, um, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, chosen as you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood set apart to show forth the praises of God as it says in 1 Peter 2.9. Okay? You know, you are chosen to be God's representatives in the world. But you are a holy nation. This is what God wants you to be. It's something that you aspire to. Even Paul, who wrote all this stuff, says, hey, I haven't gotten there yet. But I leave all that stuff behind and I press forward to the high calling of Jesus Christ. Go farther in and higher up to follow Jesus, even though I am not perfect. But we're God's chosen ones, that he's chosen us to show forth his glory and praise in this world. As messed up and doofed up as I may be, God wants to work through me, and he wants to work through each and every one here. And everybody who might be watching online now or on video later, and, you know, some of my classmates may be watching. So, you know, he includes you too. You know, because I know that people watch some of these things later on. And it's really important that we remember that we don't represent ourselves. We represent the king. We represent the king of kings and the Lord of lords because we're kids of the king. When we accept and follow Jesus, we become part of the family of God. All right? So we're going to put on as God's chosen ones. What do we put on? We're putting on Christ. Elsewhere in, in the other uh, letters that Paul wrote, he talks about putting on Christ. Not just the idea of become like him, which is true, but not just that, but put on Christ. And make an intentional decision. I'm going to become like Jesus. And how do we do that? And that's what this is talking about in this passage in Colossians. Put on the characteristics of Jesus. Holy and beloved people. What does holy mean? It doesn't mean I'm perfect. Holy means that I've been set apart for God's purposes. That's what the word holy means in Scripture. You know, common English usage thinks that it means that everything is somehow sanctified perfect. You've been sanctified and made perfect in the, in the sight of God by faith through Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that all of my life and behaviors have become perfect. But I've been set apart to become like Jesus. And so holy and beloved ones, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. God, that's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? You ever gotten mad at your spouse? Impatient? How could he be so doofed up? How could she be like that? Stop looking at me. You know, <laughs> because you know you've done the same thing. You know, the deal is, is that, you know, the Word of God says, put on something different. Make a conscious decision. Not that we do it all through our own strength, but God, I put on, you pray and say, God, I put on meekness. I put on humility and patience. And you know what happens when you pray for patience? You get opportunities to learn to practice patience. Right, Vicki? I see Vicki's face there. Yeah. You don't pray for that. Okay, Vicki says she doesn't pray for that because she gets opportunities to practice. 
That's what, that's what happens. We get opportunities to practice patience. But God calls us to bear with one another, to deal with the issue and forgive each other. As God has forgiven us, we need to forgive each other. That's part of how we avoid that thing about Jesus was talking about. Ju do not judge that you be not judged. Because if you judge, you're going to be judged with the same measure. How do we avoid that? We forgive. We practice humility and grace. Kindness. Meekness. Meekness does not mean wimpiness, by the way. Meekness means controlling your power and your strength. It doesn't mean I lack strength or power. It means I control it for the benefit of other people. So I'm not harming or overbearing, but I am meek. Jesus, and these are all characteristics of Jesus, by the way. Jesus was all of these things. And so, finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, remember in Scripture that when it says brothers... Biblical Greek, just like Biblical Hebrew, uses a masculine plural form of the word to mean the collective. And so when it's, unless it's speaking directly to a group of two or three men, it would use a plural masculine form of the word to mean a collective of men and women. Just like if it was speaking to two or three women, it would use a plural feminine form of the word but when it is used in context of everybody, they use a masculine plural form of the word because that's the way biblical Greek is, just like modern Spanish or a lot of other languages that have gender characteristics on words. English doesn't have much of that. But finally, brothers and sisters, what is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is anything, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So instead of judging, what do we do? We try and find anything that's commendable. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't say, I don't agree with the current political administration. I mean, that's, you know, you can have a political opinion. What is scripturally you shouldn't do is being a condemning, nasty, ratty, bad way of saying it, right? You know, you can say that, hey, this is what I find to be good in them. This is what I find to be wrong in them. This is what I find to be good in the other party. This is what I find to be wrong in the other party. Because they're all wrong in some ways, and they're all right in some ways, just like everybody out there in the world has something that's good and something that's not good. Because we all, our righteousness before God is as filthy rags. None of us measure up before God's standard. So let's be careful about whatever our standards might be and about how we deal with other people with it because the measure with which we judge is how we will be judged back. So whatever is true, in other words, when they say this whatever, you know, there, and Paul is emphasizing whatever, find something. Not just, hey, you know, it's blatantly obvious that this is true and honorable and just and pure. Whatever there is, focus on the good things, the right things. Don't focus on the bad things. You can take the bad things before God to get them straightened out, right? But... When you judge others, be careful. But if you judge somebody else and say, hey, that was an honorable action. You're making an opinion, a judgment, right? That was an honorable action. That was a lovely thing that you did. That was a commendable thing that you did for somebody else. Notice you're making a judgment characteristic call. And that's what's going to come back to you. So focus on what's true and honorable and just. If you want to, if you got a dog, right, and they got a bone, Mike and Vicky have little dogs. Uh, they, 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 I'm being facetious when I say little dogs. They're like 
monster dogs. Okay? If you went there and, and they had an old, dead, dry bone, right? And you try and take a bone away from little bit. It's little bit, little bit, 110 pounds or whatever. All right, you try and take a, okay. Dogs named kitty, kitty cats named cat, dog, yeah, whatever, you know. It's, anyway, so the, the, you try and take a bone away, it's gonna hold on to it. But if you walk up with something really cool and neat, you know, pig's ear, a nice knuckle bone straight from the store, and offer it to the dog, the dog's gonna be like, hmm, sniff it, spit out the old dry bone, and he's gonna take the good thing. But if all the dog on the street has is that old dry bone, he's gonna keep it because that's all the dog has. You wanna give something, you wanna take away the dry bone, give him something better, right? So if you're gonna judge, judge based upon giving something better. Not about how could you be so doofed up to think that. Don't, don't take that path. Take the path of encouraging whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is of excellence, focus on these things. And that's what Scripture is trying to do, to change us from the inside, right? Don't model ourselves on the behavior of the world around us, but let our behavior change modeled on your new mind. This is in Romans 12. And then, so this is how we do that. And, you know, and if you're concerned about things like, oh, um, you know, what's going on in the world, which we really should be, and as believers, we should stand against the evil that's going on in the world and the corruption in government and stuff. But you could go to Isaiah, chapter 28 in Isaiah. It's talking about Isaiah is prophesying against Jerusalem, but it's the same characteristics as of today that we can pray Scripture to come against that. But what's God's solution? According to Isaiah, chapter 28, is that government in his day, in the same way today, has established a covenant with death and established a cloak of lies. And God says, I'm going to sweep that away. How does he do that? With a hailstorm of righteousness and a flood of the Spirit of God. So if you're concerned about it, instead of nan 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 to other people and speaking judgment about people in government, go to God and say, God, your word in Isaiah chapter 28 says this. I'm praying that you send that hailstorm of righteousness to wipe away the covenant of death established by ungodly political leadership that you're going to take away the cloak of lies and establish truth and righteousness and justice once again. There's always going to be evil in the world until the end, right? Go read Revelation. It's just always going to be there. We in the church that have a relationship with Jesus Christ need to stand against that evil and that darkness and push back against it. How do you do that? It's not by talking, unless your talking is prayer to God or talking to make things happen in terms of righteousness. But just complaining about it and judging it doesn't change it. Because we need to focus on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, what's pure, what's lovely, what's commendable, what's excellent. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so before we condemn and criticize others, we need to focus on, well, is there something, before I critique, is there something in this worthy of praise? But don't go do the thing. Well, you know, that was really good, except, and then you spend the next 10 minutes focusing on the except, right? Nah, no, you're deceiving yourself. That's not what Scripture is trying to say here. Focus on the good thing. 
You may need to talk about the thing that was a problem, but focus on the good thing, right? That should be your priority. Okay, let's stand. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to show us how we should change our thought process and our behavior and how we do this. And then we're going to pray a blessing. And then we're going to be dismissed. Lord God, I pray that you reveal to us how to take the log or the beams out of our eyes. Because we have beams in our eyes and we need to know how to remove them. We need to know how to live the way Jesus called us to live. Father God, you love us. You love us beyond measure. You made a way for us for salvation. You made a way for us to live. Even though you don't take away the storms, sometimes you cause us to walk through the storms, but you're walking through the, with the storm with us. I pray that you help us to be like Peter and get out of the boat and walk on the water with you in the midst of the storm. That we have faith to be able to walk with you. I thank you, Lord God, for giving us revelation about how we should then live. That person that I've been judging or been receiving judgment from, how do I respond to that? Oh, I, need, I know I need to respond in love, but how do I do that, Lord? Lord, help us to incorporate the words of Scripture that we saw, that we focus on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is righteousness. You know, focus on these things, Lord God. We put on Christ. We put on the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, help us to live and become conformed into the image of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I pray, Father God, that you show each and every one of us right now where we have failed to live up to this command of Jesus and that we take time to repent of that and make a commitment to follow Jesus, to put on Christ, to learn Jesus Christ, to become like Jesus, that we focus on whatever is true and whatever is noble and whatever is good, and, but at the same time we stand against darkness, we stand against evil, we stand against the cloak of lies, because we know that you, Father God, are more powerful than anything in this world, and that you are righteous and holy and true and faithful, and just, and merciful. I thank you for your grace, Father God, and your love, because there's no greater love in this world. I thank you for that, Father. Help us to live as you've called us to live. And I pray a blessing upon us as we depart. And it is my prayer that our love, your love, according to Scripture, but our love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that we may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you for being here today. Spend some time, get to know each other and fellowship. I'm sure that there's still coffee and snacks and everything else out there. So feel free to partake. <laughs>